very good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's live webcast on building digital fluency in organizations, jointly hosted by People Matters and Nullscape. My name is Mint from People Matters, and I will be your host for today. Let me start off by highlighting that digital transformation is no longer a nice to have. It is, in fact, an existential imperative for organizations. We saw it happen last year. Companies around the world accelerated their digital strategies to the point that five-year plans were executed in a matter of months. And that has been a great development for many. But there is a catch. People readiness. Now it is easy enough to build and sign up for new tools, new apps, new platforms. But are people keeping pace? That is the big question that many are grappling with today. And so, it is a great pleasure today for People Matters in partnership with Nullscape to present this exact exclusive session where we will find out from industry thought leaders what they are doing to build digital fluency in their organizations. I'm very excited to welcome our speakers today. First, we have Chok Costa Chakravati, the Executive Director of Global Human Resources at Johnson Controls Hitachi. Welcome, Costa. It's a real pleasure to have you. So, Costa is the Johnson Controls Hitachi Air Conditioning, Human Resources and General Administration function worldwide, except for Japan. He directly manages a 100-strong team across four continents. He's got extensive international HR leadership experience, and we are really looking forward to hearing from him. Also with us today, we have Avandi Farizal, the Human Capital the Director of Maybank. Welcome, Avandi. A couple of years before the pandemic, my colleagues had the pleasure of interviewing you. And if I recall, at the time you had mentioned the role that digital plays in forming connections to the younger generation. So we can definitely get more good observations from digital fluency from Avandi today. Also with us here, we have Rajiv Jayaraman, the founder and CEO of Nowscape. Welcome, Rajiv. This is the first time having you at a virtual session with us. So Nowscape is a leading global experiential learning technology provider that's working with over 375 organizations across 25 countries, and it's popular in India and APEC. So Rajiv brings real, some really interesting insights about people readiness to the discussion. Thank you to our speakers for joining us today. Thank you. Also with us today, also with us today is Manu Nanda, the Chief Business Officer with Nowscape, We'll be hearing from him later about some strategies for gearing towards the digital workplace. Welcome, Manu. Pleasure to be here. Now, before we launch into our discussion, a quick note for today's attendees. If you have any questions during the session, please feel free to use the chat window. We'll bring them up towards the end of the session, which we have sometimes set aside for audience Q&A. So to do, stay tuned to your chat box and keep posting the questions you have for our speakers. Now, Without further ado, I'm going to open the, the discussion with a question. Before we can talk about digital fluency, we need to know what it means to us. So for each of our panelists, I have this question. Given how the focus of digital fluency varies from organization to organization, how do you define digital fluency within your company? Can we begin with Kostav? Sure. Am I out of it? Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, digital fluency has been gaining traction quite significantly over the last several years, but I think has really come into the forefront uh, of management consciousness in the last 18 months, particularly because of COVID. I think that as organizations grew bigger and uh, were engaging in more and more cross-border transactions, the importance of coordinating business across multiple geographical and time zones um, strongly started relying on the digital fluency that was prevalent in these organizations. And, and so to the extent that organizations wanted to operate as one mind for different bodies in different countries, it was important that these companies embraced digitalism within themselves. But at the same time, digitalism was also increasingly becoming important in the customer interaction sphere, especially for organizations in the retail space. Or in you know, uh, or involving multiple external customer interactions, but also with with organizations in the B two B space, because increasingly customers were also you know as businesses geographically widely prevalent, and so if we had to provide our customers with standardized, effective services and products uh, across their entire uh, footprint, geographical footprint, we would have to keep pace with them in terms of our own ability to leverage technology to provide these kinds of services. 
So I think uh, the internet has become ubiquitous at this point for businesses worldwide. And the only way that we can really um, survive in today's industry and in fact even dominate the markets that we are in is to be digitally fluent, both uh, as far as our customers' perceptions of ASCO, their moments of truth with, with ASCO, but also more importantly, in our own internal way and method of operating. So for us, digital fluency is not about specific tasks that we do or specific investments that we do in specific areas with specific stakeholders, right? It's about a way of life, a way of operating. Uh, in our day-to-day -day business, uh, today, for instance, about 50 to 60 percent of our employees work online uh, from their residences. And in the absence of tools like Microsoft Teams, there's just no way that we could even do a regular day-to-day -day business day meeting, right? Um, now, there have been many advantages thanks to these uh, adoptions of these digital technologies, but I will seize my answer for the time being at this point uh, with just one statement that in the absence of uh, digital technology and digital influence in the organization, uh, the world that we are living into will be practically impossible for any organization to function. With that, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Costa. That's a really good point that without digital fluency, it's almost impossible to function today. What about you, Avandi? What does digital fluency mean at Maybank? Yeah, uh, thanks, Min. So, yes, uh, passively digital is one of our uh, key strategic uh, now for the business. And we accelerated the digital transformation to address our future digital organization so far. We use our local uh, regulator, uh, digital maturity assessment, which consists of uh, data, technology, risk management, collaboration, uh, governance and customer, as well as people. So the key one here is how we uh, assess uh, digital maturity assessment as well for people. Uh, in Maybank, we have the six future pillars uh, skills that actually uh, uh, now we try to uh, accelerate it. While we always uh, measure it with the absolutely with the tests uh, in evaluation for the knowledge of the habit uh, with the, during this uh, skill we develop, but uh, it's not enough. I, I do believe uh, uh, we try to continue as well with our uh, sort of way that to to our people and to our business leader how they think uh, their uh, fluency, and absolutely uh, we look at as well uh, our utilization of 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 our people using the, the digital. Uh, I think that's, that's uh, our experience so far. I mean, thank you. Thank you, Evandi. Yes, definitely one thing that digital is about is people and we really need to keep that in mind. How about you, Rajiv? As a learning provider, it's definitely all about people for you too. Yes, Mint. Um, so my insight into digital fluency actually comes from our experience working with more than 300 plus organizations across many countries who are trying to grapple with what does this all mean, right? So this led me to write a book a couple of years ago called Clearing the Digital Blur, right? So while in the industrial age, we spoke about numerical literacy, right? And and um, literacy in its purest form. Today, we are speaking about digital literacy and going further beyond, we're talking about data literacy. Now, why is this um, important? We know that 52% of companies on the Fortune 500 list have disappeared from that list in the last 20 years. So that's the, the mega chain that's going on around us, right? And if, you, if you're not conversant with the rules of this new game, uh, we'll be left behind. So that's the sense of urgency here. Now, before I get into digital fluency, I think it may be useful to spend a minute on digital itself because there is a lot of blur around that. What does that actually mean, right? Uh, from one company to the next, one function to the next, you could define it very differently. For one person, it could be ones and zeros. For the other, it could be automation, cloud, and so on, right? So for us, it's not a thing. It is not a destination. As as, as long as you think of digital as a destination, as an app, uh, we are not digital yet. As uh, Kasav mentioned, it's a way of life. It's a way of working, right? Unless it touches our every day, um, right in the way of working, we are not digital yet. Obviously, we are leveraging technology, but to achieve three very important outcomes. One, customer experience. Second, agile. Third, unlocking new value through data. In other words, experience, agility, and data are the three, I think, cornerstones of, um, of digital. So if you are fluent in across, uh, across these three dimensions, then I could say, yes, um, the organization is digitally fluent. 
Thank you, Rajiv. I really like that point that it's got to be across all of these things. And really what I'm hearing here is that digital fluency is really about not just being familiar with the tools, it's not just about having the technology, it's about being able to work with it, alongside it, within it. Bearing that in mind, my next question is for Avandi. Now, you mentioned pervasive digital being one of Maybank's strategic priorities. And this is really interesting because when you say a pervasively digital, how do you measure this? How do you measure this pervasiveness? How do you determine when your workforce is digitally ready or the level at which it is ready? Yeah, uh, as I mentioned before, pervasively digital, we look at as well from our utilization of, of our digital actually for our customers. It's not for employee first, absolutely for customers. Um, what our traffic using digital so far been utilized, for example, uh, how many percent of our customers already make a transaction in the bank using digital, for example, okay? And then in reality now, the bank, uh, I can say that 90% of Maybank Indonesia transaction already been in digital. Only 10% now left still in the our bank, uh, uh, real, the the uh, the bank, yeah, as, as, as a building still. Uh, so so that's that's we can say that's uh, so that we move to 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 digital already but again we must ensure our people readiness as well so so the reason we, we absolutely we look at that um uh, how many cases for example there is uh, incidents uh, there is a mistake for example uh, there's a feedback from customer we always continue this uh, like like other uh, speakers said this is the new one yeah meaning in the, the last uh, 10 years like for example at least we we try to transform everything Absolutely, people still in transition to go there. Uh, always continuous learning for that. That's mean. Thank you. Thank you, Evandi. That's a really good point. I'd like to direct the next question across staff because here we have a slightly different outlook. So for banking, which is retail focus, it'll be all about the digital fluency of the customers as well. But for manufacturing, there's been a lot of conversation about how digitalization would drive value, how it can create goals, make objectives more attainable. So what aspects of digital fluency is Johnson Controls Hitachi focusing on to drive that value? How are you integrating these aspects of digital fluency across the organization? Great question. Thank you. <clears throat> so Johnson Controls Hitachi is basically into building automation, building management solutions. So is our parent company, Johnson Controls. Um, as an organization, we are strongly focused on digitalization as a goal for not just uh, the manufacturing part of our business, but also the management piece, the back-end support piece as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Part of our vision for the future is to help build a healthy planet by building healthy workspaces and residences for the people who live and work in them. So therefore, what are the solutions that we provide our customers? Right? We basically help our customers with efficient, effective, and safe heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, better space and workforce management, workflow management, sorry connected security, emergency response, and compliance systems, the remote building operations, monitoring, controlling, and maintaining your building systems, right? Dynamic space utilization. Now, particularly in the modern COVID situation, this has become extremely important because it includes benefits like social distance monitoring, contact tracing, alerting, face mask uh, detection, clean and safe air, uh, touchless access, building navigational aids, right? Better reporting and insights, in terms of you know the the people the number of visitors the utilization of various spaces etc cetera, etc cetera, so that we can be more efficient and effective in maintaining the safety and security of the residents so we have a very recent innovation that we call the open blue technology and what this does is it helps customers to see how their buildings come alive by leveraging data from inside buildings as well as beyond buildings and therefore to manage their operations systematically the customers can so tap the power of data-driven artificial intelligence, advanced air solutions, flexible environmental controls. So therefore, you know, keep the residents healthy and productive while at the same time achieving strong return on income. Now, what you would note is that all of these outcomes that we are trying to drive are very strongly dependent on data and connectivity. In the absence of connectivity and digital uh, technologies, none of these offerings that we that we know our customers need would be able to be product produced. Not work, right? So bringing these technologies to market for us has actually meant a far reaching drive to build digital fluency within the organization, not just with our customers and with our technology platforms. So over the last five years, we have actually invested very heavily in digitizing our operations at every level, ranging from manufacturing, supply chain management, marketing, 
customer outreach, business management systems, IT, human resources, procurement, compliance, almost all the areas of a business have undergone a rapid transformation in terms of more and more being digitally enabled. In fact, in the last 18 months, this unprecedented acceleration of digital workplace adoption through tools like Microsoft Teams or Blue Jeans or Facebook Workplace, I think has only helped us to accelerate our internal transformation much more. Uh, because now there is no way, even for those last holdouts in the organization that were relying on, you know, paper pen processes or manual processes, at this point, if you're not even able to go to the office, the only way to work is through one of these workforce tools, uh, you know, workplace tools. Then that makes it that much easier for us to translate our digital vision into action on the ground. But I think more important than all the training and the tools, the drive to build a strong digital work culture in the organization, that has been extremely important. So all the tools that we have, Microsoft Teams, chatbots, these are all just small pieces of the puzzle. Uh, the overall transformation really has been in terms of changing the hardship of to think digitally and to be open to working digitally first. So that in turn, when we speak to our customers with this language, it is backed by an entire organization that works in the same way. Back to you. Beautifully put, you have to you have to be open internally to digitalization. So my next question is for Rajiv, and it's also a little related to being open to digitalization. In fact, digital learning strategies you see have their own set of channels, and sometimes this takes a whole strategy to roll out across the organization. So Rajiv, the CEO of a learning tech company, what are the pain points you're seeing in this? when it comes to bringing out the strategy, when it comes to making the channels viable for people, both within your own organization and when you've implemented the platforms for others? Okay, that's a great question, Min. Thanks for asking that. So I'd like to answer this by focusing on a few myths uh, that we all carry in our heads about what is digital and how do we become uh, digitally fluent. Uh, number one, digital equals technology, right? So that's a popular myth, right? So obviously digital is enabled by a large extent uh, through technology, but it's not the be all and end all. Um, so with re in addition to the, the, the toolkit, the tool set, the mindset and the skill sets are also very important, um, right? So we need to look at it a little bit more holistically. So that's uh, myth number one, I would say, right? So we need to overcome that to have a successful rollout within the organization. The second one that I usually see is in large organizations, typically there is a digital center of excellence um, that is set up. And anything that is um, has anything remotely to do with digital is handled by that particular team, right? So it becomes yet another silo within the organization. So it doesn't become mainstream. Digital as a capability doesn't become mainstream. So digital is not just the tech team's responsibility. It is everybody's game because the game itself has changed, right? So everyone knows uh, needs to know the rules of the game. Uh, the third one is with respect to cascading of uh, these digital capabilities. It can't stay with just certain levels within the organization or certain teams. Um, it, it needs to have a widespread impact. Like Kausav mentioned, it touches every aspect of the business. Um, so on that front, one needs to ask a question around strategy, capability, and culture. Right? All these three elements have to be aligned for us to reach any kind of uh, digital outcome. On strategy, you could ask a question. So while the digital strategy is well understood at certain levels within the organization. Has that been cascaded well enough? Capabilities, today there is a, a need to unlearn as well as we relearn new things or learn new things, right? Um, with respect to user experience, with respect to agility, data literacy, and so on. So those are new capabilities we need to add. And not to forget culture, uh, right? So there are a lot of cultural changes that we need to bring in as well for all of these things to stick. Right. So what I'm, I guess, trying to say is one needs to uh, take a broader view of uh, what digital literacy means or digital fluency means and not just get pigeonholed into technology learning. Thank you, Rajiv. That's what, that was a very interesting set of insights. I'd actually like to invite Avandi and Kostav to chime in here. Do you see the same things happening in your organizations that Rajiv has described? Is it the same kind of pain points you're facing? If so, how are you dealing with it? Okay, maybe I go first. Uh, yeah, I I think uh, yeah I I fully agree and align with Rajiv. Uh, digital, uh, not just uh, a tools, not just uh, a technology, but mostly starting from the people, from the culture, right? And then then and then 
Uh, that's the most critical one. Yeah, yeah. Again, uh, technology uh, we can use it plug and play, like if if you want. But in reality, if people are not VD or not fluent with the technology, it will be not uh, uh, fully utilized. Okay. So so uh, so in our experience, we starting first uh, just uh, from the our journey, starting from awareness level first. Yeah, we cannot make people digital behavior not starting from if people not aware, starting with aware first. Okay, a lot of communications there, a lot of trainings there, a lot of maybe the message from the top management there. After that, we go for uh, the second stage, we call that acceptance. Okay, the acceptance level, we can come with the uh, a new uh, policy, for example, uh, the, 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 and then the, after that, we can go to the next step, absolutely, to reinforcement. Okay, reinforcement meaning how we make a success story Okay, such a story about about the utilization of uh, digital. Maybe uh, we can align with our KPI or scorecard and like that. And absolutely go to behavior. So we cannot just go directly to digital behavior in one day. We need this uh, milestone. We need a clear uh, journey that we need to communicate and we need consistency. Absolutely as well. We must continue with the omni channel, not just use one channel for communication. Everything use the many channels as 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 our uh, option or alternative. And they need a strong leadership as well to support and to coach this uh, to make it happen in our uh, company. Thank you, Min. Thank you, Vandi. That was really insightful. Very interesting to hear about what you're doing. How about you, Costa? Yeah, am I still audible? <coughs> yeah. Yep. Okay, so thank you. So, building on what Rajiv and Irvandi have already said, I think. Uh, Rajiv made a wonderful point. It's important for us to understand what the word digital is and, and relate to it from that perspective. Now, the word digital is a relatively new word, I think about a five years old. Um, and in the last few years, there have been a couple of definitions that have evolved for this particular word from different contexts. One definition was that digital is equal to SMAC or SMAC, if you remember, which stood for social, mobile, analytics, and cloud. And so I think just about three or four years ago, the general consensus was that anything that had to do with these four domains of communication and interaction would be termed as digital, right? Another important uh, definition that has evolved is that digital is rich media content, which means technology approaching a perfect simulacrum of life, as perfect as currently possible. So that means you have intuitive design, seamless man-machine interfacing and integration. These are all aspects of it. But if you really look at what digital is today, we've reached a certain level of maturity in understanding and applying digital at the workplace, right? And to us today, digital is, it's not important what it is or how you define it. Digital for us is whatever it does for people. I think is what it does. And what digital really does for us today is that it is technology enabling human innovation and learning and enhancing the human experience by removing certain bottlenecks and obstacles and enabling unimpeded access to data tools and people. So any technology, a technologically enabled solution that provides us these benefits as human beings is digital. And so as Rajiv very rightly said, digital is not about technology. Technology are like the building bricks of the digital experience. It's like confusing the bricks for the building. You need the bricks for sure, but you have to build something wonderful and relevant and important out of it, useful out of it. And that's where I think both, I completely agree with what, what Rajiv and Swami said, changing this perception that merely introducing a tool or merely bringing technology into automating a process does not mean that you're a digital organization. It just means you're starting to experiment with digital. Ultimately, it's about employee experience, customer experience, the human experience. So that's where we are driving. Thank you, Costa. So what I'm hearing today is that really digital fluency is about changing mindsets, about building a culture, about people, about educating people, about getting people to be comfortable with it. So my next question here is for Rajiv. We've been talking about culture and mindset change, but how do we get this culture and mindset change to stick? How do we get the capabilities together with the stick? You know, so that's not just something that you install, people use it, and then they just set it aside and forget about it. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, in fact, so I, I often think in terms of the two A's that are very prevalent, the, the keywords that we use. One, there's an app for that, right? So if you want to solve a problem, you want to think in terms of an app. But the other side of the problem is adoption, 
uh, it's very easy to develop apps these uh, these days but very difficult to drive adoption uh, within the organization now what are some things that we need to do from a culture standpoint so that some of these things stick uh, you know to your to your question one i think there is role modeling that is needed right from the top right uh, leaders can't say okay rest of you go digital i'm going to go print out my sheet or send my assistant to get my print out right that doesn't work so we, we need uh, role modeling within the organization second it's not just the leaders there i think is a need for at least um, a critical mass of change champions right at various levels within the organization and this is not hierarchy based whoever has that aptitude for digital can become the champion within the organization as and when a new change is rolled out these are the folks that will cheerlead they will introduce they'll play the role of the innovator within the organization i think that critical mass has to be built within the organization right and um, then of course digital to me in a lot of ways is asking a prov provocative question to us machines are learning the question is are you right so to that extent are we building a learning culture within the organization that's i think an important element within uh, the, the whole context of digital culture if you just uh, unbundle what agile means right uh, agile in essence means building measuring and learning rapid prototyping right so learning is an integral part of the way of working itself it's not something that i'll go to an lms and and learn sometime it is actually embedded in your regular work that's how integral learning has become but if we don't have that continuous learning mindset right we'll never get there uh, right so i think that's uh, the other element important cultural uh, pillar i would say that we need to um, have in place in our organizations thank you rajiv there was a lot of food for thought i think we've got a bit to digest here I'd like to invite us just quickly take a break while we get Manu back on screen. He's got a rather interesting presentation to share with today's attendees. Over to you, Manu. Hi, Min. Yeah, just give me a sec. I'm just. So if my screen is visible. Yes, it is. Okay, thank you so much. So good afternoon, everyone. In the next 10, 12 minutes, I'm just going to give you an overview of the Nullscape Digital Academy and how we've been working globally with a lot of organizations, uh, organizations and the employees in helping them gear towards a digital workplace. As an organization, uh, Nullscape has global footprints. We are headquartered out of Singapore. And other than that, physically present in uh, four other uh, three other locations, which is Malaysia, India, and the United States. We are a 100-plus happy employee organization. We have a very solid network of close to about 350 facilitators who have been certified on our methodologies, on our solutions, on our simulations to deploy our products wherever needed. And we have a network of trusted partners who are using our products, our solutions, globally to take it to their clients. A very famous quote by the former CEO of Accenture, and this says it all, it sums up everything. The digital is the main reason just over half of the companies, close to 50% companies from the Fortune 500 list have actually disappeared from the year 2000. The message is very clear. Disruption is real. The leaders and organizations need to transform or perish. This is the USP of Nullscape. We have an extensive portfolio of award-winning simulations, simulations which cover close to about 100 plus leadership competencies, competencies that are divided into two parts, if I simply put it now, which is your traditional leadership capability, and next, which is future skills, and why it's important for the leaders in today's day and age to actually master the now and the next. These simulations come packed with predetermined competencies. They come with very solid, sound academic frameworks, just to give you an idea. Uh, leading teams, which is on based on contextual leadership in terms of how do you flex your leadership styles to engage your team, is based, is, is based on the contextual leadership framework. Coaching is based on the very famous GROW model. Agile is based on the 12 principles of the Agile Manifesto. 
Simulations give a lot of data, which is a very, very important thing for the organization and for the learner, for the user to actually get a detailed report in terms of what are the decisions they took during the simulation and how did they score on the various competencies that have been mapped to these simulations. And for the organization, in terms of what are the next steps that they need to take to ensure that the learning continues. So what is digital and how have we helped organizations to build digital capabilities? And uh, I go back to what Raji mentioned briefly a few minutes back. Uh, the definition of digital is not just technology, but how do you actually leverage technology to create those agile processes, to have stellar customer experience, and that's what every organization wants. And how do you use data to unbundle new value? For us, the three, killer, three pillars of uh, digital transformation when we work with organizations is actually working closely to creating those digital mindsets, digital leadership, and digital culture. And there are enough research reports outside to tell you that organizations who have faltered on not creating digital mindsets, leadership, capability, or culture have not had great success stories on their digital transformation objectives. We work very closely with a lot of organizations, whether it's in the IT sector, the pharma sector, FMCG, and these organizations have actually come back to us with excellent outcomes in terms of what their employees experience, whether it was higher NPS scores or a culture transformation across. A question could be, okay, what is the framework that Nolscape works on? So the framework that we use for a digital transformation uh, Partnership with a lot of organization is based on the digital BLUR framework, with BLUR actually stands for B being boundaryless organization, L for limitless digitization, unbounded innovation, and R for relentless iteration. Now for the leaders to navigate through the challenges of the digital age, the leaders need to be networked, need to be sense-making, need to be designed, and need to be agile. And when we say that, what's the kind of culture that needs to be there? And culture was getting discussed a couple of minutes back uh, for, for the digital transformation journey for any organization. It needs to be open, data-driven, diverse, and a fast forward culture. Now, for the leaders to embark, to develop themselves, and to transform the organization, you need a new set of competencies that the leaders need to master. And the new set of competencies, what we call as future skill, some of them, what you see on the screen, it's actually having systems thinking, computational thinking, being innovative, agile, and having a very solid customer-centric approach. This framework has actually come from a very popular book authored by Rajiv, uh, which got released about two to three years back called Clearing the Digital Work uh, Blur, uh, based on very sound research, uh, a lot of conversation with industry solvers, a lot of case studies uh, that were available uh, are part of this book. What are the building blocks for any targeted digital journey? And a lot of questions, I'm sure all of you have a lot of questions. Actually, how do you embark? So the four pillars that we normally use are knowing digital, doing digital, becoming digital, and being digital. And this all depends at what maturity level the organization is, at what maturity level the learners are, and that is how the solutions are co-created to ensure that the outcomes are what the organization actually wants. How does it actually fall in place? We do very solid, strong baseline framework in terms of actually assessing what are the awareness levels of the learners, understanding where do they stand, doing digital persona assessments of the leaders in terms of what's the digital persona by use of psychometric tools, and also on the digital readiness quotient. Once we get this kind of data, which is the baseline data, is when we go to the stakeholders and tell them, hey, this is where you stand. This is what your leaders are talking about of your digital strategy. This is where people are talking about their awareness levels. And then we help co-create with the organization uh, you know, towards targeted development journeys, which could be through a use of virtual instructor-led sessions, self-paced courses, hackathons, and our powerful simulations. So where have these success stories been deployed or where is it that we have worked very closely with a lot of organizations? In the Asia Pacific region, uh, we've been working across some of the large organizations, whether it's MCMC in Kuala Lumpur or Air Selangor, 
Air Asia on the financial side with the Monetary Authority of Singapore, Axiata, working very closely to help their leadership teams, whether it's at the mid-level or senior level, get understanding of what agile means, what design thinking means, and how do you actually help the organization in the next level of transformation. A recent uh, success for us where we have collaborated with Sony Network Entertainment Limited, uh, actually won a Brandon Hall uh, Award, where Sony was actually looking for creating, developing leadership mindset. It was primarily on, uh, you know, for Sony, there's a transformation happening. I'm, I'm sure you've read the media reports in terms of creating exceptional customer experience or addressing future of content. And we work very closely with Sony on certain competencies, which is digital leadership, agile leadership, and creating an ecosystem of digital chain champions within Sony network to embark on that digital transformation journey. So that's a bit about uh, Nolscape. Uh, please feel free to write in in case you have any questions, would be happy to respond. Uh, back to you, Mint. Thank you, Manu. There were certainly quite a few interesting points to consider in your presentation, including the levels of maturity an organization is at, which is something I think we need to start with. Before we can gain digital fluency, we need to know how fluent we are in the first place. Now, I also see that during the break of the presentation, a lot of the audience members have been sending in interesting questions for the speakers. I'd like to bring up one question for all the speakers. We have been talking about digital fluency strategies, but how do we determine how successful our strategies are? So what are some key indicators that organizations can use to gauge the success of the digital fluency agenda? Mm, would anyone like to start on this one? Yeah, Mint, I'll go first. Um, so going back to the definition we uh, spoke about, you know, what is digital after all? Yeah. Right? We, we said it is uh, about better customer experience. When I use the word customer here, it could be internal customers or employees. It could be our channel partners. So I'm using the word customer a little loosely here, but the key word is experience. How do we measure experience, right? So that, that's one. Second is agility. Uh, the third element is unlocking new value uh, through data. These were the three building blocks of digital we spoke about. So typically when we work with organizations for the first one, there is some sort of an NPS score that we want to measure. Are people willing to work with you? Is their experience better now compared to before? Uh, right? Are you able to map them across all the moments of truth? Uh, right? And how is your score across all the different touch points? So that's a tangible measurement uh, that we can speak about. The second, in terms of agility, um, again, multiple parameters. Some organizations tend to equate agility with being paperless. Right? That's a physical manifestation of agility where you've knocked off um, anything that's physical, you've become completely digital and, and hence hopefully agile, uh, right? Are you doing things faster, cheaper, better, and in, more in alignment with what the customer wants? So that's the measurement for agility. The third element is unlocking new value. A lot of organizations are measuring digital as a new revenue stream altogether. Now they're capturing a lot of data. What new business models am I looking at? Uh, for example, with a large private bank that we work with in India, one of the measurements they have is on their banking platform. What is the new revenue stream uh, that they are unlocking on top of the platform? For example, X percentage of the revenue comes from selling movie tickets. Something that you would have laughed at five, seven years ago, a bank selling movie tickets is not an idea we would have been comfortable with. But today, a bank is no longer a bank. It's a, it's a lifestyle partner, uh, right? So that's, again, another measurement that we look at when we are moving the organization in the path of digital fluency. Thanks, Rajiv. Kostav, Avandi, would you like to chime in on this? The indicators of digital fluency, how do you measure them? Can you go Kostav? Uh, yeah, maybe I can go next. So I think Rajiv has brought in some excellent technical perspectives. And I believe that he's at the cutting edge of the working with several clients on how actually to measure and implement digital. Um, now, what I can share in addition to that is that there have been quite a few different models that have been proposed to evaluate uh, digital fluency in an organization. For example, there is one model, I think, that talks about certain specific 
different types of skills, right? Operational skills, information skills, strategic skills, formal skills. Um, there are other organizations that kind of look at uh, certain outcomes of, of digital implementation. For example, you know, the amount of content being created, the amount of collaboration that you're able to see, uh, the ability of uh, employees to create and use digital materials on a day-to-day -day basis, and so on and so forth. Now, as far as my own profession is concerned, which is human resources, I like to go back to the most recent definition or, um, yeah, uh, you know, the competency set for human resource professionals that was published by Dave Aldrich, I think just a couple of months ago, where he identifies digital literacy as one of the key skills that a HR profession needs to possess, right? So of the five competencies that he mentions, mobilizing information, which is really central to digital literacy, is one of the most important ones. And the way that Dave Aldrich talks about mobilizing information is that he specifically highlights his importance in simplifying complexity, which in turn helps to accelerate the business as well as to develop human capabilities. And how it does that is by fostering collaboration between people at different parts of the organization who may have access to different types of information. So very practically speaking in businesses which I have been a part of, I think apart from skill-based measurements, uh, which can be done you know, at an individual employee level, looking at content creation across the social media platforms of the organization, uh, the amount of digital collaboration that is taking place, uh, and the amount of data that's being leveraged in order to drive data-driven decision and not simply you know, traditional methods of decision. These for me are very important high-level indicators of the digital literacy of the organization. Obviously, you know, as we evolve, it becomes more and more important for us to evolve these metrics also going forward. So it really depends on the level of evolution of the organization uh, and where it is on its digital adoption uh, life cycle spectrum. Yeah, back to you. Yeah. Uh Okay, maybe I can add uh, uh, from Rajiv and from Costa. Um, yeah, as mentioned before, uh, we look at the, the number of uh, business, uh, percentage uh, business from digital. We look at the new customers uh, uh, using a, a digital as well and from digital channel as well as additional uh, new customer to the bank. Uh, we look at the, the traffic, uh, we have it, the additional one from digital. We look at the NPS and the promoter score uh, from customer on digital as well of employee survey. I think the all measurements there, uh, yeah, is, will be data analytics, uh, data insight for us uh, to be uh, used for our digital uh, uh, analytics for the future st uh, states. Okay. That's all I mean. Thank you. Then you're on mute. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. Sorry, everyone. Thank you, Bandi. Thank you, Costa. I was going to pick up this question from the audience that is very closely related to the measurements and how we measure digital literacy. We have an audience member asking, how do we identify the right level of digital investment that is required for our organization? How do we calculate how much we want to put in and then how do we justify it to our leadership? This seems a rather sticky one. Who would like to take it? I'll let uh, Kostu or Irwandi take this one. Yeah, yeah, this is a corporate yeah, yeah. question. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe I go first. Yeah, it's it's not easy to answer this, uh, uh, but absolutely, um, yeah, should go with the business justification uh, again. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, the design of the the new digital investment we want to have it, and then uh, continue with with the projection of new digital business we have it absolutely this is normal uh, business proposal but again um but i want to emphasize here digital is not always it's a got about the money yeah like like you said yeah and then you must uh, people are always thinking digital is expensive sorry to say people are always thinking digital is always expensive it's not the, it's not the right way thinking about that we can we can for me, in my view, my experience is always say that um, yeah, budget is a matter, but not everything. Meaning, again, thinking about from the mindset, thinking about from the uh, skill, and then we we can start from the what the pilot we want to have is first. Not sometimes we don't need to make it everything from the beginning, so we can start step by 
start uh, tak apa sekolah step step by step and then uh, 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 as a pilot first okay it, even we can combine with our internal approach so meaning sometimes people not thinking about oh this will be a big investment to start with digital okay the intention one is the strategy and the intention you want to do it that's the key one that's in my view maybe uh, for staff and Rajiv you can edit yes i think i can i can kind of add to that some very practical insights right now this is an interesting question because you started off by premising it or viewing the digital agenda from the lens of budgets um, and i get where that comes from now as an organization especially a global organization reorganizes itself to work in the current frame of business uh, the landscape of business increasingly there's been a tug of war between how much of centralization the organization has to adopt and how much of decentralization it has to adopt. now this is a constant tug of war right when companies are going through periods of greater change and greater stress they tend to, they tend to become more centralized and when business is booming and uh, you know organizations realize that different markets have different needs and they need to be catered to locally then they tends to be greater move towards decentralization particularly in the last i would say two years or so the tendency across the world generally has been towards more centralization compared to decentralization so today budgets typically are being handled centrally and a lot of the authority and, and autonomy that regions used to have earlier uh, have been kind of controlled or tamped down quite significantly so to to really answer your question how do you sell it to management from a budget standpoint today i think today the best business cases that fly are the ones that make sense uh, to address the pain points of centralized leadership but say three years ago i would have answered this question very differently it would have to be regional leadership and regional leadership's pain points so we'll have to adopt the kind of a it depends approach a flexible approach depending on where your company is and what situation your company is facing but broad brush strokes i would say the answer is pretty much the same right identify which are the key pain points that your stakeholders are facing at the end of the day digital for the sake of digital doesn't make sense all digital investment really is to solve business problems so what problems are we trying to solve right for example if we had to invest in and i'll speak from the hr perspective because i'm an hr professional right maybe i can start with that is that if i wanted to invest in workday it's probably several million dollars of investment which uh, which i might have to justify to my leadership is extremely important but then the obvious question is how do i justify what is the business case i make for those millions of dollars investment so then if i'm talking to an organization that is increasingly centralized in its way of operation a big advantage of workday is that it gives visibility it gives better control you're able to manage your headcount and your workforce planning much better uh, you can standardize your systems and processes and hr policies across the entire world or at least have better grip on what are the varieties of hr policies or benefits policies that we have around the world you know the kind of workforce that you have you're able to do some analytics on the workforce and better invest in their development and their productivity all these are very powerful arguments to make on the other hand if we're talking about for instance investment in, in in marketing then you know what kind of investment are you talking about right for example investing in building um you know, business partner portals where you can connect them better to your internal uh, you know branding and and uh, product management product marketing initiatives and, and components uh and, and spares distribution network right or are you talking about customer portals uh so you need to need to define what your agenda is and some some uh, extent of you know uh brainstorming to figure out maximum impact versus maximum effort or you know effort uh, impact matrix where you kind of choose the low hanging fruit first and then identify the specific stakeholders whether it's centralized or regional leadership and identifying what pain points you're trying to address and then making the business case for it so I mean, I understand why both Irvandi and Rajiv are a little hesitant to answer because it's a very broad question. Uh, but I guess this is the overall methodology that one would adopt in, in addressing this. So go piece by piece, be strategic about it, identify low-hanging fruit first, figure out your stakeholders, identify their pain points, build your business case, and sell. Sell for your life's work. That's a great point, uh, Kosa. If I may add something to what uh, Irvandi and Kosa have mentioned, there's something that we can learn from this whole agile mindset. Um, the, the idea of minimum viable anything. It could be minimum viable project, minimum viable platform. Even today in today's context where some of us um, don't feel great uh, working from home and you, you're having one of those down days, they are even talking about a minimum viable day. Right. What's the minimum viable thing that you want to do today and to feel good by the end of the day? So minimum viable is that mantra that I want to give you for to break this thing where you have a $5 million budget that no one's going to approve. 
but you want to start somewhere, right? So what is that minimum viable start, which will give some data for leaders to look at, and then they say, ah, so if you are able to take this to the next milestone, then I might consider investing in this, right? So maybe that agile approach to starting with from scratch, building minimum viable projects, so to speak, uh, can be one way to break this deadlock. The other one is uh, on a lighter note, how do you get your proposals approved by the uh, CFO? Just to add the word AI in it. Uh, maybe they, they'll, they'll approve it. Right? Automation is a flavor of the uh, season. But the one thing that I want to suggest here is while automation gets a lot of press, augmentation does not. Augmentation is where you want to attach a human being to technology, right? And upskill the human uh, and, and you see better benefits compared to maybe even automation, right? So some level of balance between automation and augmentation is needed in, in, the, in the industry today. Over to you, uh, Mint. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you, Kasta. Thank you, Abandi. That was definitely a very intensive question to debate. I'm, I'm going to move on to something a little lighter now, but still very implementation focused. Because we've been talking about, about business case, about what's viable, about tech employee needs, we have an audience member here asking, how are speakers identifying the technological needs of the employees before you choose to fill the gap with and invest? Who would like to share a bit about this? I can probably take that. And I think this is much easier question than the previous one so <laughs> thanks to the person who asked this um i will go back to basics right uh, technology for the sake of technology doesn't make sense so what we typically try to do is to understand where our audience is at what their pain points are and sometimes it's not about current pain points it's about opportunistic uh, pain points so for example one of the areas where we invested in is an onboarding chatbot not a very significant investment in terms of money, but in terms of time, definitely it was, right? How did we identify this? Well, we looked at the number of people being hired. We, we, uh, we looked at the diversity of onboarding and integration programs that the entire company was having across the world. And we asked ourselves a simple question. If one of the areas that we need to really uh, enhance our employee experience is the new joiner experience. And, you know, there's a simple adage that if you cannot measure something, you cannot improve it, right? What gets measured gets improved. So then can we at least figure out a way of measuring, controlling, managing, and improving these experiences? Now, once you start thinking in a structured fashion about solving this problem, the obvious answer is that you need to have something that runs globally, that is standardized, that can be easily updated on an ongoing basis, um, that is accessible across geographical and zone boundaries. It's not dependent on people, but rather runs based on systems. Then when you solve all these problems, right, when you tick all these boxes, the answer that best fits the solution is digital technology. That's how digital really works, right? So then why, why did we identify the solution? Because we first of all defined the problem. It just so happened that this was the best solution. For us. So I think that's how typically this works. You have to be closely in touch with your stakeholder base, your user base, whether it is employees or customers or new joiners, whatever demographic, whatever cohort that you're defining for yourself. The better you get to know them, I think the better you understand their pain points and the potential opportunities that you can take advantage of. And then work backward from there and throw a vision out that's a bold vision for yourself and say, I want to achieve this. Right now, this is where I am. So there is a gap between where I want to be and where I am. How do I bridge this gap? And invariably, you will see that digital is, if not a big part of the solution, a crucial part of the solution. And I think that's how digital gets in. Thank you, Kostav. Yeah, to add Costa, yeah, yes. I think Costa covered uh, uh, quite a holistic view on that. Yeah, again, I fully align starting with the pain point of employees. So uh, we cannot use uh, what's it called as the approach of ecosystem, correct? We look at our ecosystem of our, 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 our stakeholders, like, like, like Costa said, that ecosystem, what we think is, is our state or company thing, correct? So again, uh, so the the for the criteria we can use, for example, is uh, to be friendly uh, use, user. Yeah, meaning the user is very easy to 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 operate this. Uh, okay, and then can can we think uh, able to generate the traffic? Because sometimes we have digital, but in reality, people are still using manual. Because they not not there. Uh, so what's the meaning of 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 the the tool we have? It, for example, or what the value proposition you offer? Correct. So people can see they did help their life. Have the job okay that's that there's some parameter i think we can use it uh, in my experience okay that's to just to edit cost of uh, comment thank you 
So there's an insight that I wanted to share from uh, MIT, uh, where they're saying that CX, which is customer experience, cannot ha happen without EX. So in fact, they say CX equals EX. So um, going back to the definition that I started with, right? let's say customer experience and how are you measuring through NPS scores? All right, NPS scores obviously is a measure of uh, net promoter score at various touch points, right? There needs to be some technology to capture all of that. So that, yeah, that's a must have technology. If you're measuring NPS, you want to impact that number. But going uh, deeper into that, so for that NPS score to be measured, you have a customer experience technology, but what's the equivalent employee experience technology, right? So going one step back into the organization, really checking, and I, I think to Kasa's point as well, all of this boils down to information and availability of data. Right, you can you, you may want to give an uh, instant gratification kind of an experience to the customer that is not possible if the employees don't have real time data internally, right? So we don't often think about that. So uh, so that's I think one decision making um, you know criterion you can use while you are investing in these technologies. Thank you, Vandi. Thank you, Rajiv. I think there's been a lot of discussion here about employee experience, which is pretty coincidental because I see at least three or four questions on lineup that are related to employee experience. I'm going to combine them into one, which is how do you make sure that people are able to con continue getting engaged, continue having a good experience when using these digital tools? Can I take that first? Because that kind of coincides with what I wanted to also give as my closing remark. So it might oh, save us some time. <laughs> I think it's a beautiful question. And in fact, this was something that I wanted to highlight, um, that the risk of being of, of in adopting digital technology, one of the most important risks is that you go to the other extreme and become too digital, invest in too much technology and make that the be all and end all of your experience. Right? So we have to keep in mind what the point of technology in general and digital technology in specific is, which is to enhance the human experience. So it's beautiful that you know the paradox of technology, at all, if you look at it overall, is that technology needs to make your life so convenient, so comfortable, and so easy that it fades into the background to the point that you don't really ex realize that it even exists. But it's quietly there in the background doing what it needs to do so that you can continue to be yourself, explore your potential, learn what you need to learn, contribute, be productive, realize all your aims and aspirations, and basically have a better and bigger human life. That's what technology does. right? Now, the I would say that you know the, the trap with adapting digital technologies is that you have so many tools, so many screens, so many data points you need to enter that people just go crazy with all the digital options. You know, if, if I need to get a, a help desk ticket for my laptop, then I need to go to one portal. And if I need to get a printer installed, then I have to go somewhere else. And if I have to do something else, then I have to turn three somersaults and then tip three, tip three glasses of vodka into my throat, and only then it will happen. <laughs> So the more complicated you make your company life, you know, the more difficult life becomes for people and the more they're going to be averse to digital options. Then what happens is at some point it becomes a farce. You know, we send out a mail uh, announcing a new tool and everybody looks at the mail and says, here's yet another new tool. It's going to make my life more difficult, more miserable. So if you reach that point, I think you're defeating yourself. So just to summarize what I, you know, what I said in the beginning, the essence of digital is to make life simple. So if you simplify working with people, to the extent that the technology can recede to the background and human experiences can come to the forefront with digital, you have achieved your goal. So intuitive design, automated and simplistic workflows, logical and easy and flexible management systems, adaptable systems, fault tolerant systems to some degree. These are important when working with human beings and we have to design our processes first and then the digital solutions later, generally speaking. Some kind, sometimes this is different. For example, you might define processes to be too restrictive, but you know, work, one of the beautiful things that Workday does, for example, is that it democratizes the human resource management process and allows managers and employees to manage a lot of their own information and, and workflows, which I think is one of the beauties that digital can really reveal, is that there's a lot of simplification you can do by democratizing things. So to the extent that democratization works, to democratize. That would be my two cents. Thank you, Costa. We're getting rather close on time, so I'd like to invite the other speakers, Vandi and Rajiv, if you have any other closing remarks to make. Okay, just one 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 sentence uh, to add uh, what other the uh, Costa uh, mentioned and, and uh, Rajiv as well mentioned before. So um, in digital transformation, 
what do you need to do humanizing technology okay, you need technology but we still need the human approach to do it uh, talking about human centered design approach okay. thanks Min. thank you all right and thank i you. want to do a plus one on uh, costa and irvandi and i just want to add one more thing um a provocative uh, thing that i mentioned earlier machines are learning are you uh, what are you yeah uh, what are you doing to uh, to make yourself a better learner right so that's that's the uh, parting you know thought i want to leave you with that's a wonderful way to close digital fluency learn <laughs> <laughs> now we're now we're really close on time so i'm afraid to wrap up the day session I hope that for all the audience, you were able to at least get some insights that would help to answer the questions, if not directly. But do feel free to follow, our, follow us on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on social media. Stay tuned to your inbox. Thank you to all our speakers for sharing the great insights. It was a very interesting discussion, especially when it came to the sticky questions earlier. Thank you to our audience for sharing the interesting questions. It was a very fascinating discussion. For all of you, Hastava Bandi Rajiv, it was a real pleasure having you here at last today. Thank you, Mint. Thank you, People Matters, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye -bye. It's been a pleasure.